Everybody's standing. How many are excited about Elevation Nights? We are weeks away. Come on, Holly. Holly is going to tell you, well, speak of the angel. <laughs> I love a girl. Come here. Get a wide shot on her. I love a girl who can rock plaid and petty. That's Tom Petty. Plaid, petty, and praise. She does it all. But right now, look in that camera. Tell them uh, where they need to go and where we're going to be. Okay, so I was thinking about how people watch online every week and they wish that they could be here. I'm telling you, Elevation Nights is like Elevation Church came to your city only. There's one thing that's better. We still have you in yes. Elevation Nights, so that's amazing. Favorite pastor. We will sing all of your favorite songs. Every single one. If you come to Valentine, we're only gonna sing four songs. If you come to Elevation Nights, we're gonna sing every single one of your favorite songs. So here's where we're going. We're going Austin, Oklahoma City, Minneapolis, Kansas City, Denver, St. Louis, Fort Wayne, and Toronto, Ontario. We're coming your way in just a few weeks. And Say can them I... again, Hall. Austin, okay. Texas. Austin. I gotta wait till they back up on the screen. <laughs> here we go, here we go. You thought I memorized them? Austin, Oklahoma City, Minneapolis, Kansas City, Denver, St. Louis, Fort Wayne, Toronto, and can we tell them? Tell them that. We added some dates for the fall. For the fall, you can get those too. ElevationNights.com. I don't know those. tour at a time. Yes. I'll have a panic But we attack might be week. coming close to you. Yes. If those aren't yours, we might be, just check. Just check ElevationNights.com. Somebody say, the angels are coming. The angels are coming. Somebody say, Holly's coming. <laughs> Pastor Steve is coming. Elevation Worship's coming. John Sal's coming. John Sal, are you an angel? Maybe some days. You sing like an angel. But Jenna said sometimes you act like the devil. She told me that. True. Let's see if you got the angels on the tour bus on day seven of Elevation Nights. Holly and I have so many wonderful friends in ministry. Today, Pastor Rich Wilkerson is here with us to bring the Word of God. He pastors the Great Food Church, based out of Miami, Florida, touching the world for Jesus Christ. I asked him to take this pulpit and preach God's Word to you today. Let's show him we're ready to receive it. Let's go, church. Welcome, Rich Wilkerson. Come on, church. Anybody happy to be in the house of the Lord today? Hey, come on. From around the world, right here in Charlotte, North Carolina, wherever you're at watching at home, whatever device you are watching from, can we just go ahead and give the Lord a big shout of praise? I'm telling you what, there's, there's something in the atmosphere here, and I would just say to anyone who's watching who's not here in the room today, if you can be at one of these nights, you need to be here because the Spirit of the God, the Spirit of God is moving in this place in a mighty way. And I was thinking just as we were worshiping, because man, there's just such a tangible sense of God's presence. And it's beautiful. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Religion makes you proud of you, but the gospel makes you proud of Jesus. And I don't know about you, but I came into this house for one reason, which is to give the one true God, come on, all the praise that He is worthy of. All over this room, come on, let's lift it up. Let's give Him a shout all over the room today. We love you, Lord. We magnify you, God. We praise you, Lord. The angels are coming. About to change my whole message. Turn it into angels in the outfield. You got an angel with you now. That'll preach, that'll preach. Do me a favor, find a few people around you. Just say you look better than I remember. You can, you can grab a seat. It is good to be in God's house today. If you have a Bible with you, quickly reach for it. If you don't have it, we'll have it up on the screens for you. Turn with me to the book of Mark. Mark chapter 6 is where I want to share some thoughts today. The Lord has really put a message on my heart, and uh, I believe that we are all here today, and I believe He's going to speak to us in a great and mighty way. And 
I just gotta be honest with you, it's always such a privilege and uh, a real honor uh, to get to come and preach behind this pulpit. This church uh, is touching the world. And it's not just touching the world, it's touching me. And uh, I'm so thankful for the ministry and the leadership of your pastors, uh, Pastor Stephen and Holly. Uh, I just think that they're the world's finest. Uh, not only are they just incredible preachers and leaders, yeah, we can put our hands together, but have been um, just very, very good friends to my wife and I, their children. We just admire this family. I think you need a vision and a reference for all areas of your life. Vision is that thing that gives pain purpose. And uh, you need vision for, for marriage. You need vision for, for pastors. You need vision for your business. And you guys are just a huge reference point in our life. And we're just so thankful for you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for encouraging us. Uh, I heard some dialogue in a movie the other day, and it was, uh, this question was asked, what's more important, the journey or the destination? And the man thought about it, and he responded, the company. That's how I kind of feel when I'm around them, that I don't really care what we're doing. I want to be a part of it. Uh, whatever, wherever Elevation's at, whatever Pastor Steven's doing, I just want to be around you guys. And thank you so much for your life. Thank you for who you are. Can we really put our hands together? Can we just thank God for them today? Just amazing. Amazing. Come from Miami, Florida. That is where Jesus lives, if you've been wondering. <laughs> uh, pastor of a church called Voo Church, married to my wife, Don Shree. She sends her greetings. And uh, today, uh, I want to preach from Mark chapter 6, starting in verse 45. Let me lay some groundwork, and then uh, I'm going to preach this thing. This is what the Scripture says, starting in verse 45. It says, Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. And after leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. Later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and it was alone on land. And he saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them walking on the lake. He was about to pass them by, but when they saw him walk on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and were terrified immediately. Someone say immediately. Immediately he spoke to them and said, take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. Then Jesus climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down. They were completely, someone say completely. They were completely amazed. For they had not understood about the loaves. Their, their hearts were hardened. If you got a pen or something, maybe underline that passage. Their, their hearts were hardened. But when they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret and anchored there. And as soon as they got out of the boat, people recognized Jesus. They ran throughout the whole region and carried the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages, towns, or countryside, they placed the sick in the marketplaces. They begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak. And all who touched it were healed. How many of y'all know there's more to the story? Anybody been enjoying the teaching and the preaching of your pastor these last few weeks? I just love it when he gets on. I love when he gets a word from God because all us preachers, we get a word from God. <laughs> there, there certainly is more to the story. I think story and narrative is so important. The story you tell yourself will be the life that you live. What story are you telling yourself? But today, I want to kind of draft off where you guys have been as a house. And this is what I know. I know that um, there's more to the story, but every story has a storm. But every storm has its purpose. And I want to preach for a few moments today from that subject. The storm has its purpose. The storm has its purpose. Look at your neighbor. Say, neighbor. The storm has its purpose. Look at your other neighbor, the one you don't like so much. Hopefully, you talk to your spouse first. Oh, dear God. Say, the storm has its purpose. I love the passage of Scripture that we're reading today. This is Mark 6. Uh, this account of this storm takes place also in Matthew's Gospel. But uh, here in Mark chapter 6, this is the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is interesting. I was just there recently, but it sits 700 feet below sea level. 
About 30 miles to the north is this big mountain range called Mount Hermon that sits high up in the air, and the cold air from that mountain will mix with that warm air from the sea. And if you go there, they'll tell you that there's quick, fast thunderstorms, massive waves that can kind of come out of nowhere. And I actually just got to go, finally, for the first time uh, to the Sea of Galilee back in November. Um, I went Miami to the Sea of Galilee. Now, just saying that, right, it just sounds so easy. Miami to the Sea of Galilee. But how many of y'all know it ain't that easy? Uh, we, we, we took a flight, Miami to uh, Tel Aviv, and I flew with uh, my three children, ages five, three, and one and a half. <laughs> In economy, um, t- to Tel Aviv. Now, it's funny because people start the year, it's like, yo, Lord, I really want you to stretch my faith. Very, very easy. Very, very easy. You want to build your faith in 2023? Get three toddlers. Take an international flight. The whole experience is just challenging. You get on the airplane, and I can literally see people as I'm passing by the row sigh. I go, thank God they're not sitting next to me. <laughs> Parents know what I'm talking about. I have one friend that when they travel with their kids, they bake cookies the night before because they pass it out to all of the passengers around them. People are like, thank you for the cookies. Like, this is a peace offering. Um, And we we took off, you know, what is it's a 14 hour some flight. And, you know, it's just these kids are going crazy, just trying to get to the Sea of Galilee. And uh, on the way over there, we hit uh, turbulence. You ever hit turbulence that's so heavy that you start confessing hidden sin. I'm talking about, we were hitting turbulence with these kids. Like I'm just repenting going, God, if you're going to take me, take me now. You know, some, some turbulence gets so bad, right? Like you ever been in that kind of turbulence where like you could take a stone cold atheist and they become a Holy spirit tongue talking (laughs) Pentecostal. There ain't no God turbulence. He shunned it almost. I mean, like, bro, it was that kind of turbulence. I was sitting on the front row and I was going, man, it'd be cool if we could bring turbulence to church sometimes. <laughs> Worship team would love that. Introducing a new song, not going so good. Turbulence. <gasps> <laughs> Offering's kind of low. Try turbulence, you know? Altar call. Turbulence. It, it, bro, I mean, it would work, right? The storm has its purpose. We, 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 we landed, got the bags, got on the tour bus. I mean, it just took so much time, so many delays, finally to arrive at the Sea of Galilee. And I sort of just say that up front as an illustration that it sounds easy, Miami to the Sea of Galilee. But how many y'all know, if you want to get to the Sea of Galilee, you're going to have to go through some stuff. It's just the reality. We live in a time right now where everybody wants to arrive, but not everybody wants to take the trip. I think we all want a life of purpose, but very few of us really want to walk through the process. If you want to get to, you got to go through. This is a biblical principle that you must get deep down in your heart. God is taking you to some stuff, no doubt about it. But more often than not, in order to get to, you're going to have to go through. I believe God is going to take you to mountaintops. You go from mountaintop to mountaintop, but you got to go through the valley. He's going to take you from blessing to blessing, but you're going to have to walk through sacrifice. You're going to go from glory to glory, but you got to walk through some suffering. And you're going to go from miracle to miracle. But how many of y'all know you're going to actually have to go through the storm? The storm has its purpose. I don't know who I'm preaching to today, but as you walked into this house, I just sense it as we were singing. Many of you in this room, you are headed to a breakthrough. Some of you are headed to a promotion. Some of you are headed to a miracle. Some of you are headed to a brand new season. But if you're going to get to, you got to go through. Somebody said amen in this room. We might have to bring some turbulence in this room today because I believe today God wants to speak to you. I think through is one of God's favorite words. It's what Isaiah said. He said, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. 
when you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. Anybody in this house today, can you testify that you're walking through something right now, but you believe in faith? God is going to get you to the other side. If there's anybody like that in the room today, go ahead and give God some praise in this house. He's taking you through. As we go through, we face some stuff. But we're going to have to get a new perspective on our storms, on our obstacles, on our opposition, on our challenges, because it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. You will go through storms. You will go through difficult moments, but the story is bigger than you could ever imagine, so don't give up in the storm. Mark chapter 6 is the most beautiful illustration of this truth because here's Jesus. He gets done doing this big miracle where he feeds 5,000 some people. He stole a kid's lunch, fed everybody, sends the disciples in a boat to the other side. They finally get to the other side. When they get to the other side, Jesus starts healing people over there. But in the middle of these two great miracles, they have to face a storm. It's interesting because I've read Mark 6 so many different times, but it's important that when you're reading the Bible, that here's the most important rule about reading the Bible. Three rules, really. Context, context, and context. You have to put the text into context. And many times I used to always just kind of read devotionally in Mark chapter six. And I saw these guys in this storm and it's really, really interesting. There's no doubt about it, but you need the full context of what's taking place. Because I don't know if you see this, but when you go back in Mark chapter 6, we see that Jesus does a miracle to the masses, and then they go into a storm, and then Jesus gets over there to Gennesaret, and he does a miracle to individuals, but in between is a storm. And it got me kind of thinking, are you in a storm, or are you just in between two miracles? Are you in a storm... Or are you just in between the thing that God started and the thing that God's going to complete in you? If you will choose in your spirit today, I'm not going to back down. I'm going to keep moving forward. Do not place a period where God has placed a comma. He's taking you through. This thing will not take you out. You're going to get to the other side. The storm has its purpose. Are you in a storm? Are you just in between two miracles? I've just decided recently, when I'm in turbulence, oh, he's taking me through. I've just decided I'm going to tell myself over and over again, I'm just in between two great things that God is doing. When I look at the text, there's just a few basic observations that can help you. We could make lots of observations, but let's just make a few today, because if you're in a difficult moment, if you're in the middle of your story and you're thinking about quitting or you're wanting to give up, the word of the Lord for you today is simply this, the storm has its purpose. It's not that I think that God plans all of our storms, but I certainly think that God will use all of our storms. He will use what you are going through, and he will bring meaning and purpose if you'll look a little bit deeper. The first reason why I believe that God lets us go through storms and the purpose of the storm is that storms make you realize you're not in control. The scripture says that he sends the disciples in the boat to the other side. And that little passage right there, Mark chapter six, verse 50, or uh, yeah, immediately, let me see it. I don't have it right there. Mark chapter six, it says that they were straining at the oars. I don't know if you guys can bring that verse up. They were straining at the oars with all of their might. I love that picture because here's this picture of these disciples trying to get to the other side. But as they put all of their effort as they put all of their energy, they are unable in their own strength to get there. How many of y'all know, it's one thing when you fail and you didn't really try. It's another thing when you put your heart, your soul, all of your focus into something and you came up short. These disciples are doing everything they possibly can in their effort to get to the other side. That's what Jesus had promised them. That's what Jesus had told them. Jesus said, get in the boat and go to the other side. They're just obeying. Isn't that amazing? You can obey Jesus and it can lead you into a storm. I think sometimes we're like, oh my goodness, if I just follow God, everything's going to be perfect and easy. Read the words of Jesus. A wise man built his house on the rock 
And a foolish man built his house on the sand. And when the storm came, the wise man's house stood strong and the foolish man's house collapsed. Did you catch it? Wisdom doesn't prevent storms. You can be wise. You can be educated. You can be at church every week. You can do all the right stuff and still have to face a storm. I don't get to control it. All I get to do is prepare my spirit and my foundation for it so that when the wind does come and when the rains do come, this house, it might bend, but it's not going to break. And some of us in this room today, we need to be reminded we are not in control. And it's only in a storm that you realize, oh, wow. I'm telling you, you can have all the money in the bank account. You can be educated. You can have the dream job, dream girl. But all it takes is one little storm. All it takes is a phone call from the doctor. You have cancer. I don't care how healthy you are. I don't care how many sit-ups you can do. You can't stop cancer. I don't care how much resource you have. There are certain things that push you back and go, I'm not in control. But there is something about our God that he loves it. When we realize and we are reminded we are not in control. The scripture says that there they are. They're straining at the oars. You got to love Jesus. Jesus leaves his place of prayer and he walks out onto the water to them. I just, and these guys go, ah, oh, it's a ghost, which is hilarious because the only thing worse than being in a storm is having a ghost in your storm. <laughs> this is a bad day. It's a ghost, but it's, it, it's not a ghost. It's, it's Jesus. It, it's, it's not a ghost. It's, it's Jesus, but they're in the storm, right? They're, they're dealing with the financial pressure. They're dealing with, with, with the breakup. They're dealing with the heartache. They're, they're dealing with the addiction. They're dealing with, with the pain. we got all these things that start clouding that we can't see Jesus. And, and the rain's coming and the wind is blowing and it's dark outside and I can't see Jesus. I can't, I can't see Jesus. And I, Jesus is coming to help me, but I don't feel like help's on the way. I'm scared. I'm trying, to be, I'm trying to row. I'm trying to get there. And all the while, Jesus is looking right at him. Old preacher one time came through and told a story, said the house was on fire and the father came home. And when he got home, he saw his little boy up in the window and the little boy was standing in the window, two stories up and the smoke is rising. The place is on fire. And the dad shouts out to the little boy, son, jump. And the son's up there. He says, dad, is that you? And the dad says, yes, son, jump. And the son says, but dad, I can't see you through the fire. And the dad said, son, I know, but I can see you. And I felt like I wanted to preach to someone today that you might be in the middle of the storm and you might be saying, I can't see Jesus. I hear you. But the good news is he can see you. He's walking through it and he's on the way to you. He sees you. The storm has its purpose. You are not in control. Here comes Jesus walking on water. And when he shows up, sometimes Jesus says stuff in the Bible that you actually have to just let it sink in because it's hilarious. And also it's like, well, it's not cool at all. That's not cool. That's not what I need right now. What does he do? Walks in the water. Dun, 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 dun. Take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. And like... <laughs> It's funny and it's also kind of like mean, like, bro, bro our boat <laughs> is sinking. <laughs> the wind is blowing. I know. Dun, dun, dun. Take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. This is fascinating because this is our story. Many times when Jesus shows up, we want him to still the storm. And then we'll take courage. It's not how faith works. Where's all the control freaks? Look at these people. Me, you know? I don't know. I don't. Uh, you ever interview an Uber driver? Control freak, you know? What's your record, bro? Let me see a license. Um, we, 
we're control freaks. We want to be in control. But look at Mark chapter 6, verse 50. This is important. Jesus says, immediately he spoke to them and said, take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Notice when Jesus shows up on the scene, he doesn't say, dun, 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 take control, it is I, do not be afraid. That's what we all want to do. When we're in a storm, when, we, when we're like feeling out of control, when, when, when pain's in our life, when, when something's coming our way, our knee-jerk reaction is, I need to take control. But that's not the faith journey. You don't get to take control. You get to take courage. And a storm reminds you, you're not in control. So what do I do, Rich? When you're in a storm, you don't take control. You take courage. Control is God's responsibility. Courage is mine. I'm going to face this thing head on, believing that the storm has its purpose. You take courage. Watch God, what God will do. I've just seen it. I can testify about it over and over again. God comes through. Take courage. What is courage? Does that mean I don't have any fear? Nah. Courage is simply the ability to face your fear. I'm done running from it. I'm done carrying it. Today's the day I'm going to walk through it. He's taking you to the other side, but you're going to have to go through some stuff. The scripture says that Jesus says, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. And then the Bible says he gets into the boat and immediately the storm settles. See, I think the purpose of the storm is not just to remind us that we're not in control. The purpose of the storm is always to give way to new revelations. Ooh, if you could get this today. The Bible says immediately the storm settled. In fact, I think we've got it. Matthew chapter 14, because I just want to cross-reference it. This is important. This is like the first time that the disciples even realized that Jesus is divine. Matthew 14, verse 32. And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. And those who were in the boat worshiped him saying, truly, you are the son of God. It took a storm. It took a storm for the disciples to realize Jesus is divine. Immediately, the wind and the waves died down. You ever notice that we're obsessed with suddenly and immediate type of things? That's, that's what's going on. Bro, like, right now, God, do it now. You know, I want it now. Suddenly. I grew up in Pentecost church. Suddenly. <laughs> and I'm all for suddenly. I'm all for immediate. In fact, God could do something immediate in your life today. But what I have learned more often than not is that God, who does suddenly, immediate, right now type of things, is usually on the heels of people who are patiently slowly, faithfully, consistently pursuing him. God moves suddenly for those who pursue him patiently. Why? Because this is what nobody told me when I was 18, getting into the ministry, is that God is slow, fast. This is so important. God is so slow, like slow, bro, S slow, bro, <laughs> so slow. It's just like, it's so slow following God. Like here I am at church again, my call time an hour before, here we go. We're going to sing some songs. So we're going to get the offering and we're going to word. Okay. Invitation and you know, e-group and then, you know, watch online and uh, slow, slow, ho-hum, ho-hum, slow, slow, slow. And then boom. Whoa. Whoa! Immediate! I remember the first time I met Don Shree, I'm just slowly following her, slow. Front row, kind of a service like this, look up, immediate, boom! Who's that? I saw her, I choose you! In one moment, I changed all of my doctrine. I named it and claimed, I choose you! Because following God, you gotta get this, is so slow. And then it's immediate. And then it's breakthrough. And then it's, wow, there's the idea. Oh, there's the song. Oh, that's the word I was looking for. Oh, that's what I needed. Oh, there's my healing. Oh, there's my promotion. Oh, I got to the other side. Because God is slow. Come on, somebody. And then he's fast. You need God to do something immediate. Just slowly pursue him. 
faithfully follow him. Because the scripture says these guys are straining at the oars. We are not in control in all of our might, with all of our flesh. I cannot get to the other side. But thank God for Jesus. Here he comes walking on the water. Don't take control. Take courage. Face the storm. Gets in the boat, and immediately the storm settles, and then they start worshiping him. I think these guys kind of got some of it right. Like It's good to worship Jesus, but I want to be a person, and I want to build a church that doesn't worship Jesus on the other side of the storm. Come on, I want to worship him like I'm in the middle of the turbulence, believing that he is the Son of God, that at any moment, even though the ground beneath me is shaking, my faith is being fortified and solidified, and I'm going to worship you for who you really are. I got a revelation that you're in control of the storm. Somebody give God some praise. Let's bring some turbulence in the room today. The storm has its purpose. And the Bible says, the Bible says that when the storm settled, then they worshiped him as son of God. Wow, now I know who you are. In fact, look at this, Mark chapter six, verse 51. Then he climbed in the boat with them and the wind died down. They were complete, I love this, completely amazed. <sighs> For they had not understood, this is so good, about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. You got to see that because some of you today, you think if you could just see some miraculous sign, you think if you could just, wow, then you would be worshiping. Remember the context. Just a few verses earlier, he feeds thousands of people with five loaves and two fish. But the disciples had already forgotten about maybe one of the most epic miracles that humanity has ever seen. How many of y'all know our faith suffers when we forget? And this is, we could, I could come back into a five week series here at Elevation Church because God has been faithful to this house. God has moved in ways that many of us have never ever seen. And some of us, we think we need a new word from God, but in reality, you just need to get back to that old revelation of awe and wonder. I know what he's done in the past. My faith suffers when I forget. And there they are in the storm, and their hearts have become hardened because they forgot about the loaves. And just so we get some clarity, because this is really important, because there's always more to the story. The scripture says that he feeds 5,000, more like probably 15,000 people. And if you can remember, the scripture says that there was leftovers. Your mama did not invent that at Thanksgiving. Jesus is Lord of the leftovers. He's not the God of enough. Whoever's watching online right now, he is the God of more than enough. Can somebody give him some praise if you believe he's got everything you need? More than enough. Any Bible nerds in the house remember exactly how much more enough there was? There was 12 baskets left. Any other Bible nerds? How many disciples did Jesus have? Hey guys, uh, I'm doing a miracle over here. It's for all the masses. But I just want to let you know, you're about to enter into a storm. Don't worry, I've packed you lunch. You've, e you've each got a basket full of food so that when you get into that storm, I want to remind you, I've already got a solution to the problem you didn't even know existed. I want you to worship God today in faith. Maybe you're in the middle of turbulence right now. Maybe you're in the middle of a storm right now, but there is more to the story. The storm has its purpose. Storm has its purpose. Many of us, we would never know he's a healer until we got sick. Many of us would never know he was a restorer until our heart was broken. You wouldn't know he was a deliverer unless you got addicted. We can go through it. The storm is revealing something about his character and nature that you need on your journey. It has a purpose. I was in uh, Chicago this summer, and uh, we preachers, if you don't know, just everywhere we go, even on vacation, we're just collecting sermons. And I was taking this tour of Chicago, which is notably one of the best or most impressively designed cities in all of the world. It wins 
architecture and all sorts of awards every year. They have a three-layered highway. I mean, it's just, it's remarkable stuff. And I'm on this tour with my family and this tour guide is just, she's blowing my mind. She's up there just, she's like an art history major and she's just dropping truth. I'm like, dang, this is, she said, you know, Chicago has more skyscrapers than any other city. And what's amazing about skyscrapers, if you don't know, is that they're built in such a way that they're made to sway so they don't snap. I was like, you want to preach at my church this Sunday? <laughs> Got that sway annoying. <laughs> Not going to snap. Sway, sway with it. In the storm, you got to sway. But she told me, look at some of y'all love that. Um, <laughs> calm down. <laughs> she, she told the story of, if you don't know about it, 1871 was the great Chicago fire. It's like the largest urban fire recorded uh, ever. And uh, it burned up about three square miles, 300 buildings destroyed, uh, or, or, or 17,000 buildings destroyed, 300 some people lost their life. And it's a really, really wild story because the fire began, but then it, it jumped into the river and the river was so polluted that it kept burning through the river and it ended up hitting a paper mill. That's not a good place for a fire to hit. And with it, it just spread and it devastated and destroyed the city. I mean, complete annihilation, complete destruction. But what's fascinating as you study the history of Chicago is that devastation probably became the reason for all of its innovation. Because would you believe that just 15 years later, the skyscraper was invented? Do you know where it was invented? Chicago. Why? Because so often in devastation, when all of a sudden things come through, I get a new revelation. I get a new idea. I discover who my God is. And I just felt it in my spirit today that God has big things in store for you. There is more to the story, but you need to lean into this moment right now. You're not in a storm. You're in between two miracles. He's taking you from glory to glory. He's taking you from miracle to miracle, but you got to go through the storm. I don't know what awaits you on the other side, but God has something good. If you believe it, somebody put your hands together all over this room. The storm has its purpose. The storm has its purpose. As the worship team makes their way up here, it's just storms, they remind us we're not in control. Storms give way to new revelations, but storms also create the perfect stage for an audacious response. I just, I know this is a word for some people here today. Problems are platforms for God to show off. We all want miracles, but we don't want problems. Problems are a prerequisite to a miracle. Your storm is a stage for God. He's going to show off. We would never have the story of Jesus walking on water if there wasn't a storm. But what's amazing about Mark chapter 6 is Matthew 14 tells the same story, but there's some other information given to us. In Matthew 14, we see it's not just Jesus who walks on the water, but so does Peter. Peter. Some of you are like, he, Peter ain't smarter than you. Peter's not more theologically sound than you. Peter, Peter sinned just as bad as you sinned. Isn't it amazing? Peter and Judas, same sin. What if Judas just would have waited one more day? Peter goes back to community. He's back to fishing. It cures him. Judas goes into isolation and it just intensifies his pain. It takes matter in his own. He takes control. Scripture says that they're out on that water and Jesus walks out on the water. Take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. Some of you today, you got to take courage. And that, that's the right word. That's aggressive language. You got to take it. You got to put it on. You got to choose it. I got to take, I got to take it on Monday. I got to take it on. I got to take courage. The Bible says as Jesus is out there, Peter sees him. And Peter's in the boat. And when Peter sees him, Peter gets the idea, Lord, is that really you? And Jesus says, it's me. And Peter goes, well, if it's you, Tell me 
to come to you on the water. I love it because here's the gospel in one word. Those of you that are watching online, Jesus says, come. Come. Everybody needs saving. Yet to all who received him and believed in his name, he gave them the right to be called children of God. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Come. Whatever you're carrying today, whatever you're facing today, whatever you're walking with today, just come to Jesus. And Peter, he doesn't think about it. He just listens to Jesus, and he steps out, and my man starts walking on water. Peter, the cussing sailor, is walking on the water. The Scripture says that when he started looking at the wind and the waves, he started to sink. Isn't that fascinating? You can't even see wind. That's how this world works. The devil wants you to focus your attention on things that are not real, things that you can't even see, imaginations in your mind, thoughts that he put in your brain. Here's how the kingdom of God works. Close your eyes and open up your ears. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of the Lord. 17 years of age, I got a word from God, and I have been clinging to it now for 20 plus years. Get a word from God. Don't let anyone get in the way of that. I hear you, Jesus. I hear you, Jesus. I hear you, Jesus. I can hear Jesus. Peter, the water is liquid, but my word is solid. One step at a time. And the scripture says, he starts looking at the wind and the waves, and he begins to sink. You see, adversity is always a great time for audacity. And Peter started right, Whew, I'm in a storm, but maybe this storm could be a stage for the glory of God. He starts walking, and as he starts sinking, he's freaking out. You got to love Jesus because it's a picture of grace. He comes on over there, and he puts his hand to him. And he helps him back up and he says, Peter, you of little faith, why did you doubt? It's amazing because I've heard that preached so many times in church. You gotta have great faith. Peter had little faith. I'm like, homie, you ever walk on water? And good news to everybody who's here today who's not churchy, who doesn't know how to speak in Christianese. According to Jesus, Peter walked on water with little faith. What could you do today with some average faith? It's never been the size of your faith. It's always been about the size of your God. It's not the strength of your faith, friend. It's the object of your faith. My faith is attached to Jesus. Adversity is a great moment for audacity, and storms create a wonderful stage for an audacious response. We're still telling the story of Peter. My kids were in Vuk Kids last week in Miami. And Wyatt came over and said, what'd you learn at church? He said, I heard about the man who walked down the water. I want to say when I get to heaven, hey, Peter, I know that storm was scary, but man, what a story it turned out to be. What's a story without a storm? What's a story without some struggle? Some of you curse in every struggle. God just, God, just get me through this. Why not pray, God, give me faith. Give me a capacity to face the storm, to keep moving. God, there's a purpose in the storm. There's a purpose in the storm. Here's what's amazing to me. I didn't see this till just recently. We're not reading Matthew 14. We're reading Mark chapter 6. Just important for all the Bible people out there. Um, Mark was not a disciple of Jesus. Um, Mark was a disciple of Peter. Almost all scholars and theologians believe that Peter dictated to Mark the Gospel of Mark. Say, Rich, why is this important? I'm saying it's important because in Matthew's Gospel, Matthew remembers that night, not just Jesus walking on water, he also says, yo, I was there, and Peter walked on water too. I think what's wild to me is that if I'm Peter, I won't be you, I'll be me. And I'm telling this story to my disciple, I'm like, yo, bro, um, night was crazy. Everyone was afraid. I was a little, but everyone was freaking out. <laughs> I, was, I was little, but not, not as much as the rest of the guys. You'll see in a second why. Um, so we're out there, and everyone's rowing so hard. But I was praying. I was praying. I was worshiping. 
and all of a sudden there, there came this celestial being. I knew, I knew it was Jesus. I just know my God is good all the time and all the time he's good. All right. And, uh, I saw Jesus and I was like, yo, Jesus, what you say? I come out there and hang out with you. And he said, come. And so it was just, you know, one small step for humanity, but one, one giant step for the global church of Jesus Christ. If I was Peter, that's how I would have told the story. Jesus is awesome. But whoa, you should have seen me that night. But somehow, we don't know for certain. Somehow when we read the story, it seems as if when Peter starts telling his side of the story, it seems like he leaves out the most important part. But maybe, just maybe, to Peter, the most important part wasn't him walking on water. Maybe, just maybe, Peter had a revelation that the most important part was solely and simply Jesus walking on water. Can I tell you something today? Some of you are in a storm. You are in a crisis. You are in a challenge. You are facing real difficulty. But something tells me if you will faithfully follow Jesus, you're going to get to the other side of this thing, and one day you will testify from your experience in the storm. And when you look back, you're not going to talk about your great faith. You're going to talk about the great grace of Jesus Christ, the God who came to you and found you and met you right there in the middle of your mess. The storm has its purpose, and it's the glory of God. It's the grace of God. I love preaching about faith from this text, but can we just all be honest? It is impressive that Jesus walked on water, but if he is God, don't we all believe he can walk on anything? This is not a story about walking on water. This is the gospel right there before your eyes. That when I was dead in my sin, when I was at my darkest moment, when I was hating God, he saw me in all of my depravity, in all of my mistakes. And he said, there's no mountain too high. There's no valley too low. I'll walk on water just to get to you. He's taking you through. He's taking you through. He's taking you through. He'll walk over the failed marriage. He'll walk over the broken business. He'll walk right through the addiction. He'll walk right on top of your anxiety. Your depression does not scare him. He can walk on top of things. He's on the way to you. He's coming to you because he wants to take you through. The storm has its purpose. 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 If I can just get you to think that way tomorrow at work, we have one today. If we get to Friday and you are still facing something, but you could just tell yourself, I got a little message. I don't remember all the message. I don't remember all the Bible verses, but I know this. The storm has its purpose. There's more to the story. Every story has a storm and every storm has a purpose. We've won. See, when you're in a storm and we're closing, how many know it's hard to see? and you start forgetting who you are. You, you know you're in a storm when you start praying prayers like, God, I need a sign. <laughs> you ever negotiate with God? <laughs> God, if you'll just do this, I promise you. <gasps> That's when you know you're desperate. <laughs> this past summer, I was on a break and I needed, I needed a sign. I don't pray this prayer much, but I was on this vacation there was some stuff going on with our staff and our team back home. And I just know they needed their pastor. I know they needed a word from God. And I'm just sitting there on break, watching Netflix shows, going, God, give me a sign. For three days, I prayed, God, give me a sign. God, give me a sign. And after like day three, I don't know, you know, we're just blind to stuff. Um, this, I was renting this house and, and this, is, this is the sign that was above the, the, the television. Can we pull that up? So 
So I'm praying this prayer. God, give me a sign. God, give me a sign. And above the TV, it's like, it took me three days. Like, you know, sometimes I'm like, God is like, how dull are you? You know, he calls us sheep, study sheep, not smart animals, you know? Bah. God, give me a sign. God, give me a sign. Three days. God, give me a sign. God, give me a sign. Finally, day three, I'm like, there's a sign above the television. Wow. Look at God. I, didn't, I had no idea what it meant. To my knowledge, I had never really seen it, but it's crazy because I was watching some TV show this summer about some Navy SEAL. I'll spare the details. And in the background of the show, day two, is that exact same sign. I'm like, ooh. God ever do that? Ooh. The next day I'm on the lake, I'm at some restaurant, and hanging on the wall is the sign. I'm like, ooh. Day three, sometimes I'm like, is Apple listening to me or is this the Spirit of God? Is this technology or prophecy? Because in, <laughs> I got to tell you this, because this is, I got an email that popped up from 2016 from my good friend Levi Lusko. Is it there? So I'm like, it was an email he sent me that I had screenshotted because I liked it. He had done something with this. I was like, what is in the world? Well, I was finishing my vacation and I was actually scheduled to go preach in Montana. I walk into Levi Lusko's office and look what's hanging on the wall. Can we go to the next one? Watch this. So this is what Pentecostals do in this moment. I called our general manager because I was flying back for staff retreat. And I said, for staff retreat, buy 100 mugs that say, don't give up the ship. My guy goes, Pastor, what does it mean? I said, I have no idea. But it's God. After we had ordered the mugs, I decided, what does this mean? And I found out the history of it that in the War of 1812, Captain James Lawrence, they had been attacked and their ship was going down and he was dying on the ship and his last and final dying words were, don't give up the ship. That's cool. That's a good battle cry, you know. I, I guess today now it's become an anthem in the Marine Corps, Navy SEALs. You'll see it all over the place. And that's very, very meaningful, but I didn't understand. God, what do you mean? Don't give up the ship. Don't give up the ship. Lord, what, don't give up the ship. What am I? What, are we going to battle this year? What's happening? Like, I don't, what are we talking about? And I just kept praying, kept thinking, don't give up the ship. Don't give up the ship. Don't give up the ship. Don't give up, Rich. This year, don't give up. Every story has a storm. Every story has a struggle. Don't give up the ship. Don't give up the storm. Don't give up the storm. Don't give up the storm has. Don't give up the storm has its purpose. Don't give up the ship. Don't give up the storm has its purpose. So we at Vu Church, we just started looking at each other and saying, are you struggling? If you're struggling, if you're in a challenge, you can be struggling and becoming all in the same sentence. Are you in a storm? You are on your way to the other side. Do not forget who you are. Don't give up the ship. Don't give up. The storm has its purpose. There's a purpose in your struggle. There's a purpose in your storm. And if I was at my church and I was preaching to my congregation, I would just get fancy with it. I'd just start saying all sorts of stuff. I would say, don't give up the discipleship. I would say, don't give up the stewardship. I would say, don't give up the friendship. I would say, don't give up the worship because you are a worshiper no matter what you're facing. And as you start to worship God, you're going to be made aware of His presence. He is with you in every struggle. He is with you in every storm. And if He told you He's getting you to the other side, do not doubt in the storm what He told you on dry ground. Baby, you're getting through this thing. You're coming through this thing. There's more to the story. There's a bigger miracle at place. Don't give up the ship. Don't Give God some praise. Give Him some worship. Come on. Come on. You hold my life.
for me, God is not against me. You're in with me, working to me. He's not against you. He's not against you. He's for you. He's for you. He's for you. He has a plan. He has a purpose. There's purpose to the pain. This storm has a purpose. Don't give up the ship. Don't give up this week. Don't give up. This storm has its purpose. It has its purpose. You're not in control, but you can take courage. You're going to learn something about God. You're going to see something about Him. You're going to discover something about Him. The intimacy of your relationship is going to grow because of this pain, because of this suffering, because of this heartache. Oh, this is a perfect moment right now for an audacious response. You want that type of faith that walks on water? Then you got to get out there in the middle of the storm. But you watch as your God shows up. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. God, I pray over every person in this room right now. God, who's struggling. God, any person who's in this room today that walked in today, watching online, about to give up, on the brink of quitting. God, may we hear it from heaven. There's more to the story. You're the God who does more than we could ever ask, think, or imagine. God, we don't need faith for tomorrow. We need faith for today. Give us our daily bread. We're dependent upon you. If that's you today, if you're just desperate for God, Sometimes a war just has to unlock something inside of you. Just lift your hands right there. Just lift your hands right there. Receive, receive, receive. He doesn't encourage you in your strength. He encourages you in His strength. He says, I'm with you. I'm for you. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Read the verse. It doesn't say the weapon won't be formed. It just declares mightily, it will not prosper. I got a sense in my spirit that the enemy's coming to attack some people. But hear the prophecy of the Lord that when the enemy shows up at your house, there is a sign and it says, beware of God. This house is protected. This house is covered. This house. He's fighting for you. God, we receive, we receive, we receive. God, we receive, we receive. We receive, God, we cannot stop the storms, but Lord, may we prepare today. May we build on a solid rock. If you're here today and you've never met Jesus, I'm telling you what, this is the gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son in the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. I don't know what somebody told you, but God is not mad at you. He is madly in love with you. He's the God who got up out of heaven, came down to this earth, walked in the middle of our mess, in the middle of our sin, just to save us. He's for you. He's for you. He's for you. But he gives you the opportunity to receive. If that's you today, all over the world today, you might be in a storm, but maybe this storm has a purpose that you would meet your Savior. If you're desperate today, if you're hurting today, He's here. On the count of three of that, you say, Rich, I need Jesus. I want to commit my life to Jesus. I recognize my sin and my mistakes. You don't need a preacher to tell you how bad you are. You need a preacher to remind you about how good your God is. He's bigger than your sin. If that's you on the count of three, just be bold. On the count of three, just lift your hand up high enough and long enough just so I can see it. I want to include you in this prayer of salvation. If that's you, that's me, Rich. I want Jesus to be the Lord of my life. Online, ready? One, the Bible says today's that day. Two, don't look at your neighbor. It's not about your neighbor. It's between you and Jesus. Ready? One, two, three. If that's you, lift it up. That's me, Rich. That's me. That's me. That's me. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, church, can we all lift our hands towards heaven? Let's pray this prayer. Say, dear Jesus, today I give you my life. I repent. Forgive me. I believe you are who you said that you are. Today I choose to follow you. Thank you for loving me. I confess that my storm has a purpose. I'm not going to doubt. I'm not going to quit. I'm going to follow you. In Jesus' name, 
Come on, everybody said. Come on, Elevation Church. Can we go ahead and give God a big shout of praise? Come on, somebody. Hey, thank you for watching the Elevation Church YouTube. I want you to subscribe. That way you can know when we go live and post new content. Make sure to leave me a comment. Let me know what spoke to you today, where you're watching from, and what we can pray for you about. And if you'd like to support the ministry financially, you can click the Give button now and help us continue reaching people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thanks again. I'll see you next time.